This episode of Unobscured was made possible by Simply Safe, the home security system done right. And here's something a lot of people put off home security. Well, Simply Safe Home Security has gotten rid of all the reasons not to get home security. And I'm about to tell you how you can save a ton on it, too. Simply Safe has no contracts, no markups, no installation windows, just professional quality home security with 24 7 monitoring. Save hundreds with Simply Safe's extended holiday sale at simplysafe.com slash unobscured. But hurry, this holiday sale ends January 8th. That's simplysafe.com slash unobscured. The body of Bridget Bishop was left hanging from the gallows for days. It was standard practice for the execution of felons. By leaving the results of their crime out in the public for everyone to see, it was thought that fewer people would be tempted to follow the same immoral path. We don't have any records about when Bridget's body was cut down, or where it was buried. But executed criminals were usually buried near the place of death. It wasn't respectful or sacred, and that was the point. In the Puritan mind, people evil enough to do horrible things didn't deserve a proper burial. Bridget's death might not have left a physical trace, but it certainly had a social impact. In the two weeks that followed her execution, reports of afflictions almost stopped entirely. Yes, there were a handful of exceptions— but the overall effect was like pulling the emergency brake on a speeding car. People took notice of how deadly the game had become. But nothing lasts forever. However nice it would have been for everything to grind to a permanent halt, I think all of us are very aware that no such thing was about to happen. In one of the few instances where people still reported afflictions from a witch, a community even deepens its roots into the soil of insanity and chaos, they find themselves a witch detective. Weeks earlier, when Bray Wilkins and his grandson Daniel were sick and witchcraft was suspected, Mercy Lewis offered to come and help. She was the refugee from Maine that had moved to Salem Village years before along with George Burroughs. But in 1692, she lived and worked in one of the Putnam households. And if you remember, it was she who pointed the finger at John Willard, the village deputy constable and husband of Wilkins' granddaughter, as the suspect. So when new afflictions were reported inside a Putnam house, Mercy Lewis was called in to offer her observations. She immediately identified two witches at work, Rebecca Nurse and Martha Carrier. And while both of these women were already in jail, these new accusations would simply be added to their records for when their own trials began. But the momentary pause was only localized to Salem. Far to the north, on the day after the execution of Bridget Bishop, the French and Wabanaki launched an attack on the town of Wells. The garrison and ships in the harbor were able to repel the attack, but the enemy managed to capture a prisoner, who was then tortured to death in full view of the defenders. Observant participants in the Salem situation couldn't help but see the symbolism they had struck a blow against the devil on June 10th, only to be hit back the following day. I can imagine it was frustrating to the powers that be, but also more than frightening to the rest of the community who were waiting with bated breath for it all to end. But the attack on Wells, along with the subsequent torture and murder of that single captive, also sent a powerful message to the people of Salem that was difficult to ignore. Monsters, it seems. Could be ship had been executed for capital crimes. She wasn't the first to die. If you remember, it was Sarah Osborne who passed away first, while waiting in jail for her own trial. And even though the community slipped into a two-week pause in the chaos on June 10th, that didn't mean more deaths weren't coming. On June 16th, a prisoner named Roger Toothaker died while sitting inside the Boston jail adding one more name to a list that was just beginning to grow. Toothaker was Martha Carrier's brother-in-law, but had also worked as a folk healer throughout Essex County. If people needed help with a sick cow or a mysterious ailment, they would call on him to use whatever tools he had at his disposal. Here's historian Marilyn K. Roach. 
Some people did practice a lot of folk magic, maybe more in England because they weren't all Puritans. Well, they weren't all Puritans here either, but they were white witches or blessing witches, so-called, meaning they did only the good magic. But if you have the idea that the source of it is really only pretending to do good for a while until you're really thoroughly caught in their clutches, it's not something you should be fooling around with. Understandably, that gray area between witchcraft and Puritan piety was an unsettling place to be for many of the people in the area. Roger Toothaker was essentially dabbling with magic as far as they were concerned, and that was the devil's work. Yes, he thought of himself to be one of the good guys, but enough people disagreed that he was arrested, examined, and in jail by May. I have a feeling Toothaker knew it was coming, though. Back in February, if you remember from episode one, the Paris family's neighbor, Mary Sibley, had baked a witch cake to try and cure the first two afflicted girls, but the results were disastrous. Reverend Paris and his peers viewed the use of magic, even white magic meant to help others, as an invitation to the devil. By May of 1692, Roger Toothaker found himself in jail. But the long wait for his own trial only brought him sickness and death. Like Sarah Osborne before him, his life was snuffed out by the grinding gears of the witch hunt, long before he would ever have a chance for freedom and justice. As you might expect, people were beginning to have doubts. It was one thing to throw accusations around the village, but when those words began to draw real blood and take lives, well, it felt like a bridge too far for many people. Most of that doubt manifested as murmurs and whispers around the community, but it had official representation too. Immediately after the trial and conviction of Bridget Bishop, one of the nine judges resigned his post. For anyone concerned about the trials getting out of hand, Nathaniel Saltonstall had been their source of hope, but he took that pipe dream with him when he quit, and the road ahead looked a lot less promising as a result. What happened in the days to come was a battle of wills between those with spiritual authority and those with legal power. Religious leaders like Cotton Mather, Samuel Willard, and William Milbourne all came forward with concerns for how the trial should be handled, and laced throughout all of their arguments were liberal amounts of theology. So when the governor's council met three days after the first public execution, Phipps and a handful of the magistrates reached out to the ministers and asked for their full official response. Gather together, they told them, and discuss the challenges we all face. Then, when you're ready, bring them to us for discussion. What they came back with was a written response known as the return of several ministers. It was polite and supportive of the overall mission of the Oyer and Terminer trials, but the letter addressed a bigger concern. Namely, Chief Judge William Stoughton believed that specters could not impersonate innocent people, and the ministers disagreed. There's a lot of theology at play here, and I don't want to get too deep into the nitty-gritty of it all, but essentially, people were worried about wrongful accusations and convictions. Thanks to the trust the authorities were placing in the accusations of the afflicted girls, as well as allowing Mercy Lewis to serve as a witch finder, it had become all too easy to imagine that innocent people might get caught in the crossfire. Stoughton believed that if someone witnessed the spectral image of a witch, then the person they saw was the person to blame. The ministers, though, disagreed. They believed that the devil could impersonate innocent people, literally putting on their appearance as a disguise, just to get those people in trouble. So obviously, the next question was even trickier. How can you tell? It was bad enough that no one except a handful of the accused could actually see the specters of their attackers. But now they had to play detective and figure out which ones were the devil in disguise and which ones were real witches. And the solution, according to the ministers, was to avoid prosecuting virtuous people, people with blameless reputations and no history of any wrongdoing. It was a cop-out answer, though because Stoughton believed that very few people were actually of unblemished reputation. He and his fellow judges were part of that select few, naturally. But outside of that, it was difficult to imagine anyone without a sordid past. Even Rebecca Nurse, 
who was a full member of the Salem Village Church and well-respected. And as she was about to find out, when your fate rested on invisible evidence, it was hard to see anything other than darkness. Ask most people today if they know anything about the Salem witch trials, and the most common answer you'll get from non-historians is that it was really just one big mess that revolved around property line disputes. And hopefully, over the last few episodes, I've put that rumor to rest. For you, at least. But here's where I'm going to contradict myself for a moment. When we talk about Rebecca Nurse, we have to talk about property lines. Keep in mind, these Puritan settlers were certainly focused on the mission of establishing God's kingdom in the New World. They were deeply religious people, but they were also notoriously difficult to get along with. That's one of the reasons they left England, after all. So you can imagine, living in a community in a strange place, constantly afraid of the world around them, that these settlers were on the edge and cranky about a lot of things. Back in episode 1, we talked about the differences between the Putnams and the Porters, and I don't want to repeat myself here, but let me sum it up by saying that the Porters were the wealthy family that lived on the edge between Salem Town and Salem Village. They figuratively rode the fence, so to speak. They benefited from the high society of the town, but also benefited from the resources and expansive land of the village. Keeping the two communities together as a single legal entity was in their best interest. But inside Salem Village was another family, the Putnams, who didn't have a vested interest in the town. They wanted autonomy and a break from the wealthier port community. So there was this tug of war between the two families. And then the town family showed up. They were a family from England with seven children, three daughters and four sons. And when they arrived, They purchased a tract of land along the western edges of Salem Village. Or maybe it was the eastern edges of Topsfield, because that's where the conflict began. Five decades before the Salem Witch Trials, a sloppy Massachusetts clerk, as Stacy Schiff puts it, drew part of Topsfield's boundary lines right over the existing lines for western Salem. It created a small bubble of land between the two communities that technically belonged to both. And that's the land that the towns bought. Now, as the conflict went on and grew between the Porters and the Putnams, the Putnams started to feel the need to expand farther west and get away from the Porters. The trouble was, the towns were there, sort of walling them in. As a result, the Putnams resented them, and this led to all sorts of conflict. There was a horse theft that forced the towns to sue the Putnams. They fought over firewood, something that every family needed in abundance to survive the cold New England winters, and they bickered about where each family might graze their livestock. Honestly, anything that could have been fought over probably was, and it went on for years. All the town kids grew up, of course, and married into the surrounding community. Daughters Mary, Sarah, and Rebecca became Mary Esty, Sarah Cloyce, and Rebecca Nurse all three names that should ring a bell by now, because by June of 1692, they were all in jail. And no wonder. Up until July, more than half of all the witchcraft accusations had originated from a Putnam house. You don't have to be Sherlock Holmes to understand why. Rebecca was particularly annoying to the Putnams because she married into a Salem town family, aligning herself with the wealthier porters by association. Her husband Francis was an artist there, but years after their marriage, they leased a large 300-acre farm in the middle of Salem Village, pushing the thorn right back into the heel of the Putnams. By the time the witch trials had ramped up, Rebecca was an old woman in her 70s. But despite doing well for herself and building a reputation as an upstanding member of the local church and an elder in the community, Rebecca was still accused of witchcraft. Why? Well, outside of the decades-long feud between her own family and the Putnams of Salem Village, there might be two other reasons for the way some in the community turned on her. Here's Emerson Baker. Rebecca Nurse, her case is another key turning point. Why would this wonder, this, this elderly, sainted grandmother who's a member of the Salem Town Church, a Puritan saint, why would she be 
accused of witchcraft. Well, again, notice she's a member of the Salem Town Church, not the Salem Village Church. In other words, Rebecca didn't go through the rigorous membership gauntlet that the strict conservative Salem Village Church required. Instead, she had become a full member in the less strict Salem Town, where the halfway covenant was accepted. Despite that, she was enjoying all the benefits of full membership right there in Samuel Paris's congregation. To a lot of people, it didn't seem fair. The second reason, though, was rooted in bigotry. If you remember, it was known that Rebecca had taken in an orphaned Quaker neighbor out of the goodness of her heart, but that child represented something evil in the minds of her accusers. That's because, in pursuit of their mission to build a Puritan kingdom of God in the New World, any other version of Christianity was the enemy. Catholic, Quaker, it didn't matter. They were forces of the devil. So Rebecca, through her Christian charity, had done something that many in the community equated with being a traitor. Add to this the fact that her husband Francis was part of a committee that was trying to remove Reverend Paris from his job as village minister, and we have a recipe for division and infighting. It was a bigger version of the story that most of the victims were living through that spring and early summer. But Rebecca had a few advantages over her fellow jailmates. Her family had decades of experience fighting back. They were well-connected, and they were tenacious. Unfortunately, they were going to need every bit of that in the coming weeks. The pump had been primed. If anyone was to blame for getting the community in an uproar about Rebecca Nurse and her sisters, it was Reverend Samuel Paris. Of course, he felt threatened. Rebecca and the others didn't care for his highly conservative hand on the rudder, and they wanted him gone. Paris responded with scathing sermons from the pulpit. Through March, April, and May, Paris used his position at the head of the congregation to sow discontent and fear. He preached about the devil among them, and about how anyone might be working for the enemy, even the neighbors they had known for so long. So when the Oyer and Terminer moved on from Bridget Bishop and began to hear testimony and depositions in regards to Rebecca Nurse, there were plenty of people to come forward. Mercy Lewis reported seeing Rebecca's specter attacking a Putnam boy. Then another Putnam, John Jr., claimed that his infant son died just three days after he had a public disagreement with the old woman. Thomas Putnam, Nathaniel Ingersoll, and Reverend Paris were among the respected adults who put pen to paper and wrote out their testimony against Rebecca. They were bringing out the big guns, so to speak, with the aim of damning the old woman in the eyes of the judges and jury. But they were in for a surprise. Marilyn K. Roach once again. The nurse family circulated a petition among neighbors, and lots of people signed it. It wasn't just them. So people put their names on it. This was incredibly significant. Here's historian Richard Trask on exactly why. Of the documents that survive, we have maybe about 20 of them in which either one person, a couple, or a bunch of people would send in a deposition or a petition saying that we've known her all of our life and she never looked like she was a witch or never deported her any more than a good Christian. Forty people signed the one to Rebecca Nurse. The judges went into the official Oyer and Terminer trial for Rebecca Nurse, assuming she would play along like everyone else. But it backfired. If they were going to have a cloud of witnesses to her evil nature, then Rebecca's family would bring an army of their own. And they made huge advances, too. Some of the character witnesses who stepped forward to defend Rebecca Nurse also brought unusual stories that cast doubt on the testimony of the afflicted girls. Much of it centered around Elizabeth Hubbard, the teenage girl who had seen that wolf following her that cold winter night many months before. One man claimed that during a visit to the home of Elizabeth's uncle, Dr. Griggs, the girl had talked about denying the Sabbath. Another man, a 60-year-old farmer named Clement Coldham, recalled giving Elizabeth a ride home on his horse when the girl claimed that they were being followed by the devil. After a while, she told Coldham that she wasn't afraid because she and the devil were on good speaking terms. 
A similar story, with a similar message, was told about one of the other afflicted girls, Abigail Williams. And a farmer named Robert Moulton believed that Susanna Sheldon had lied to the court when she told them that the devil had dragged her over a stone wall, because he was there that day, and he watched her climb the wall all on her own. Rebecca's own daughter, Sarah Nurse, testified that she had watched another of the accusers, Sarah Biber, actually pull straight pins out of her clothing and then prick herself in the knee before crying out that Rebecca had attacked her. It was all a farce, she said. And in a shocking move against her own family, John and Rebecca Putnam stood up in her defense as well. One of the charges against Rebecca Nurse had been that she had killed their daughter and son-in-law, but the grieving parents made it clear that the younger couple had died from a fever and not witchcraft. It was amazing, really. In the face of the frightful charge of witchcraft, Rebecca's family not only mounted a solid defense of her character, but they attacked the very truth of the accusers at the same time. It was a one-two punch that was sure to set their friend and matriarch free. Armed with all of that testimony, the jury was sent away to make a decision. Here's Richard Trask once again. At first, the jurors came back with a not guilty, and it was pandemonium in the courthouse. The afflicted children who were there, and also some older afflicted ones, started going into profound fits and so forth. William Stoughton, he was the chief justice of the panel. He said, um, have you considered some testimony of someone who said this or that? And the jurors asked Rebecca Nurse a question. A confessed witch had given testimony that she was one of us. Rebecca said, why, she is one of us. And she was asked, what did that mean? And she didn't say anything. And of course, she couldn't hear. She was almost deaf. After what must have seemed like an eternity, the members of the jury slowly walked back into the courtroom. I can imagine the room was blanketed with a tense silence as each of them took their seat. And then they announced that they'd made their decision. Rebecca Nurse, they said, was guilty. June 28th was a busy day for the court of Oyer and Terminer. Not only had they heard the case against Rebecca Nurse, but others were brought to trial as well. One of them was Sarah Good the grumbling, homeless, pipe-smoking woman that everyone loved to hate. She'd been in jail for months, her infant child had died, and her five-year-old daughter Dorothy was still in a Boston jail, the same jail that had already claimed the lives of Sarah Osborne and Roger Tuthaker. But her trial couldn't have been a stronger contrast to that of Rebecca Nurse. There was no large collection of friends and family mounting a passionate defense, there were no prominent members of the community calling the accusations of the afflicted girls into question. It was just Sarah Good against the court, and she can't have felt a lot of hope about that. One of the witnesses brought to the courtroom that day was none other than Tichuba, the slave woman from the Paris household. She was asked to repeat, for the benefit of the jury, of course, the story she told that first examination months earlier on March 1st. Of course, she'd been given plenty of opportunities to keep her story straight, thanks to the repeated visits from the magistrates over those long months in jail. Thomas Newton, the attorney general overseeing the trial, even submitted a document as evidence that came straight from Sarah's little girl, Dorothy. Despite her young age, someone had managed to convince the child to give testimony against her own mother, and as the court proceeded, Sarah had to listen to those words as they were read aloud. Local heavyweights contributed their own testimony against her too. Thomas Putnam and Ezekiel Cheever reaffirmed their earlier testimony, and Reverend Samuel Paris described the torment that his daughter and niece had gone through. And by doing so, Paris gave the courtroom clear permission from the church to view Sarah Good as the enemy. She was found guilty and charged with three separate counts of witchcraft, but she wouldn't be the only one that day. A woman named Susanna Martin was also brought to the trial, and there were plenty of witnesses available to paint her in a dark light. She was like Sarah Good in many ways. She was poor and alone. But she was also an old widow from Amesbury, a community far to the north. 
When she was led into the courtroom, the afflicted girls fell into terrible fits. Former Salem Village minister Deodat Lawson would later record that some of them even vomited blood. It was sometime during this chaos that one of the afflicted shouted out to the courtroom that they were being attacked by someone new. Samuel Willard. There must have been a sharp intake of breath at the sound of his name. Willard was not someone they would have suspected of witchcraft. Not only was he the minister of the Boston First Church, but he was a close friend and advisor to many of the judges in the trial. Thinking quickly on his feet, Stoughton suggested to the girl that she was mistaken, that she had confused John Willard with the good reverend. She was quickly removed from the courtroom, while word was passed among those seated in the crowd that it had been a mistake. It seems they were just as quick to dismiss charges against one of their own, as they were to declare women like Sarah Good as guilty. Two other women were put on trial during the same session as the others. Elizabeth Howe and Sarah Wilds might have seemed like disconnected players in the drama, but that was far from true. In fact, they were both deeply connected to the woman whose conviction began the day, Rebecca Nurse. Elizabeth Howe was Rebecca's sister-in-law, as well as being close friends with her sister, Mary Esty. And if you remember that old property line issue between Topsfield and Salem Village, it was Sarah Wilde's husband that had drawn it up. While both of the women had accusations of witchcraft hovering over them, it's clear, looking back, that there were other issues at play as well. Both were declared guilty, putting the final count for the session at five convicted witches. But the family of Rebecca Nurse wasn't ready to quit just yet. After the court adjourned, they approached one of the jurors, a man named Thomas Fisk, and pleaded their case. Amazingly, they managed to get a collection of documents, along with a written statement from Fisk, that might serve to free Rebecca from the charges. With that precious cargo of paper and ink in hand, they saddled their horses and rode hard for Boston. It was time to confront the governor. They must have had connections. Perhaps the nurse family brought along some of their wealthy porter allies. Or maybe they already had a history with the governor. Whatever the reason was, they managed to get access to William Phipps, just as they had hoped. They confronted him inside his Boston home, and then spread out all of their documents for him to look over. They explained the issue at hand, and how the spectral evidence and pins and lies had all been disproven. And then they told Phipps about the not guilty verdict that came before the guilty. They explained the confusion that had led to the guilty verdict, how her lack of hearing and a misunderstanding about a question led them to doubt her character, and all they wanted was a fair decision. Phipps was instantly sympathetic. He reviewed the documents and listened to their testimony, and right there, inside his Boston home, he reversed the court's ruling, issuing a reprieve. Rebecca Nurse was free. For a moment, anyway. When the news of the reprieve made its way to Salem, the afflicted and their support network exploded in anger. Robert Califf was a Boston merchant whose record of the trials has come to be an essential document for understanding what happened off the books and behind the scenes. He later wrote that when the news of the reprieve became known, the accusers renewed their dismal outcries against her insomuch that the governor was by some Salem gentleman prevailed with to recall the reprieve. In the clinical, detached tone of the time, we can see Rebecca's last hope for justice slip away. On July 19th of 1692, Sheriff George Corwin headed to the execution site for the second time in five weeks. Sarah Good, Susanna Martin, Elizabeth Howe, Sarah Wilds, and Rebecca Nurse all rode in the back of his wagon, all hope for salvation driven from their minds. They were lost, and they knew it. Beneath the gallows, each of the women had their skirts tied around their legs, and then the Salem town minister, Nicholas Noyes, spoke with each of them in turn. When he reached Sarah Good, though, he used the moment to lecture her and beg for a confession. Here's Emerson Baker, 
She says, you know, basically, come, come, woman, you know, you're going to die, but you might as well clear your conscience. She says, you know, I'm no more a witch than you are, and if you kill me, God will give you blood to drink, so take that. That's actually a, a quote out of Revelation, where one of the sort of the plagues that will come to the earth is, is the, the waters will turn to blood, and you'll have to drink it. So on the one hand, when I initially saw that, I thought, wow, Sarah, good. That's pretty good. She was showing noise. You know what? I'm a perfectly good Puritan, and here I am facing death, and I'm going to quote scripture to you. But it's more complicated than that, because as it turns out, back in the early 1660s, when the Massachusetts government is executing Quakers in Boston for simply trying to proselytize the faith, an Englishman writes a book about their behaviors and tells the magistrates that they have to stop what they're doing or God will give them blood to drink. So Sarah Good, in that famous quote, was actually not just, it wasn't a biblical quote, she was actually quoting from a Quaker complaint against the magistrates of Massachusetts. So there may be a lot of reasons why Sarah, I'm not, even, I'm not sure she was a, a Quaker necessarily, but she certainly lived in that part of Salem that was susceptible to where the Quakers lived. Um, so she certainly would have known about them. Might well have even had Quaker sympathies. After their battle of words, Noyes left Sarah Good and the others to their fate. Each of them was led up a ladder where a noose was tightened around their necks. Then from the safety of the ground below, Sheriff Corwin began to push them off, one at a time. I imagine the crowd was stunned by the violence of it all. An execution by hanging was notoriously graphic, with sights and sounds that could unsettle even the strongest among them. These were women they had known for years, known and trusted and spoken with, and now they were writhing at the end of a rope as their lives slowly faded away. Historian Stacy Schiff suggests that they probably didn't leave the bodies up for long. It was July, and far too hot to leave a corpse out in the sun. They would have been cut down a short time later, and hastily buried right there on the hill. Although local legend says that the families of those women, those who had them at least, returned under the cover of darkness to take their loved ones away for a proper burial. Rebecca Nurse was carried back to the family homestead in Salem Village and buried in an unmarked grave. The house and property are still there today, and if you're ever in Danvers, you can visit the museum that was once her home and stand beside the graveyard that took its place. It's a physical reminder of just how normal these people were and how tragic their final days turned out to be. Speaking of which, Those words that Sarah Good tossed at Reverend Noyes, the ones where she promised blood for him to drink, those words seemed to stick around. We know Samuel Sewell remembered them, as did those who heard them spoken prior to the execution. And I have to think that Noyes himself never forgot them. Twenty-five years later, on December 13th of 1717, Reverend Noyes passed away. Legend says that he suffered a hemorrhage in his head or throat, and as a result, his mouth filled with his own blood. He drowned, just as Sarah Good had promised. That's it for this week's episode of Unobscured. Stick around after this short sponsor break for a preview of what's in store for next week. This episode of Unobscured was made possible by Simply Safe, the home security system done right. Simply Safe believes nothing should get between you and protecting your family. That's why they only charge you what's fair, $14.99 a month. With Simply Safe, there are no contracts, no markups, and no installation windows. It's so easy, you'll have your system up and running in minutes. This holiday, you'll have everything to be thankful for and everything to protect. So get a jump on protecting your home at simplysafe.com slash unobscured. That's simplysafe.com slash unobscured. Next time on Unobscured. Looking back, it's easy to see countless examples of the authorities leading the witness. They suggest answers with their questions and give the accused just enough detail to reply with answers that fit their expectations. Maybe these men were just really bad at interviewing the accused, or perhaps they allow their bias to steer the ship. We might never know. But something else came out of the examination of Ann Foster and her family. New names from Andover. Mary Lacey Sr. mentioned two of Martha Carrier's own children as one of their own, sending the court into a frenzy. The following day, 18-year-old Richard and 16-year-old Andrew were arrested and brought to town. 